see you all. That might be nice. Thank you to all the people who are saying hello in the chat box and letting us know where you're from. I'm Jackie. I'm from Matific and I'm in Sydney. I won't say sunny Sydney because it's never sunny here anymore. Um, and if I know a lot of pretty much Eastern Australia is in the same, same position. So if you are in a flood zone, I hope everything's going better for you today. I um, hope you're all safe and well wherever you are. So I know we've got people from far and wide all across Australia, New Zealand um, and Southeast Asia joining us today, which is great. Now I can see, as I said, people are saying hello in the chat box and that's fantastic. But from now on, <laughs> just to let you know, there is also a box called Q&A. Towards the end of this presentation, we've allowed plenty of time for you to ask questions of the panel. It might be from Ian, the, for Ian, the keynote speaker, or it might be for one of the panelists or myself. So use the Q&A box only for that. So the chat box is great to say hello, but if you want to direct a question to one of our panelists, please use the Q&A box. So that I've got the techie things out of the way. All right, well, welcome to this presentation. This webinar is about educating boys, educating girls. Is there a difference? And I'm going to start by explaining who I am. So I'm from Pacific, the online maths resource. You can probably already tell that I was a teacher <laughs> for a very long time. People usually spot that quite quickly. So 28 years in primary school classrooms in various roles in Sydney and New South Wales. Uh, about six years ago, I joined the amazing world of digital mathematics been to hundreds of schools at that time. Not travelling so much in the last couple of years though, sadly, or doing a lot of Zooming. Anyway, enough about me, because we have got fantastic panellists with us today to talk about this really interesting topic about educating boys and educating girls. And I do want to start by, I won't say apologising, but explaining. Of course, there's going to be a few general overviews here. We know every child is different. Not every boy is the same. Not every girl is the same. We understand that. But there are some commonalities. I'm sure Ian, our keynote speaker, is going to explain more about that. But there's definitely certain things that apply primarily to boys and vice versa, primarily to girls. So it's going to be really interesting for us to get straight into it now, I think. So panellists, if you want to have your cameras off, you may, it's up to you, but I want Ian to actually definitely turn his on. And you know, you've heard a little bit about me already, and you're going to hear more about the panellists. You're going to hear more about Ian in a moment. I think it's important we actually start by hearing about you. I like to know all about our audience. So I'm going to ask a quick question here just to get to know you. Whatever school you're working at, if you are working at a school, what type of school is your school? How would you best describe it? Is it an all-girls school? Is it an all-boys school? Is it a co-educational school? Or perhaps it's not applicable to you. You might be working in a different type of a, a facility. So I'll just give you a moment. I just think it's really nice for us to get a feel for who we're speaking to and generally what where the audience is from and where you're working. So I'll just give you a lot of people doing the poll. So thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Give you a few more seconds to get that done and then we'll get straight into Ian's presentation. Five seconds and I'm going to end the poll and it looks like a lot of co-educational co schools, not surprising. I'll share the results there. I'm hoping you can see that. Panelists, give me a nod. Can you see those results? Okay, awesome. So we've got about 86% of people are from co-educational, quite a few from boys' school, a few, just a couple from girls' school and a couple that are not applicable. All right, I'm going to stop sharing that and move right along. So this is our agenda. Can you see that on the screen now? You should be able to see it. So we've done our poll. We're going to go into our keynote speaker. We're so fortunate to have Ian with us here today from Western Australia. Um, and then we're going to introduce the rest of the panellists and have that round table discussion. And of course, time for Q&A at the end. So Dr. Ian Lillico, welcome from WA. Hello. Thanks very much, Jackie. It's great to be part of the panel. I'm really so pleased that you can join us today. Um, Ian, if you don't know, he's the founder and CEO of the Boys Forward Institute, a former WA principal. Pleasingly for me, I hear you've had a bit of a mathematics background as well. <laughs> That's a bonus. I like to hear that. And of course, an international consultant in gender and boys education. Now, Ian, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then you will be 
headed straight to your presentation. There we go. Okay. So I'll um, start by saying, you know, I recognise some of the names that came up down the bottom. So it's wonderful to uh, see or hear from people who I've met in the past. And you probably know that I've travelled around the world extensively, apart from the last two years uh, with COVID, um, and uh, have done work in co-ed schools, boys' schools, and a variety of other institutions. And some of the panellists here today have been in their schools or, or affiliates of their schools. Um, and then there's no one proponent of, you know, boys' schools are better. As Jackie said, girls' schools are better. But I want to tell you a little bit about that. But today's topic for me is actually boys and their schooling. And uh, I'll leave a lot of the, the, the questions uh, to, to the panellists. Um, just to start off with, it has been in the last two years, especially because of, I suppose, the you know, COVID, uh, a lot of research has been going on, particularly looking at how young people react to being uh, learning at home without the aid of, of um, the teacher, without the, the support of, of the school. And um, you may know, if you read some of the reports that have come out of the, the US and, and Australia, and, and one or two in the UK, that boys have done worse comparatively to girls. So um, we think that's probably due to the fact that they really need uh, that boosting up from the teacher, the nurturing, the relationships, which is, um, which is crucial for them. Um, I'm now gonna to try to share my uh, screen and I'll just see if this works. And I'm just going to show you here. Uh, can you all see that? I hope, yep, yeah, okay. At the moment, there's a number of areas, and there's a lot of them there, that um, we're looking at in the Institute. And also I'm talking about in, in various schools. A lot of them are, are done remotely. Um, in another week or two's time, God forbid, we've got a huge number of Omicron traces here at the moment. Um, I'll be going to Goldburn talking to a, a group of uh, teachers there. And then hopefully things might start to, to come back to some normality. Um, you may know of the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual version five. And uh, the DSM-5 has now been, been out for probably five years or so, um, talks about ADD, autism, uh, special needs, uh, the, the, impact, the impact of computers or, or you know, gaming on, on kids. And of course, uh, you know, schizophrenia, all of those conditions. And it's the first one that's really got us as educators thinking, oh, there are some things in here that can be very useful to us in terms of school. And of course, I pick up because of the Boys Toward Institute, things that I think are particularly relevant uh, to the kind of work we'll be, or things we're talking about uh, this evening. Um, we took it, we look at temporal versus permanent needs and both boys and girls will go through times of family separation, of being bullied, um, of uh, God forbid occasionally, you know, drug, drug addiction, whatever it happens to be. And they will display certain behaviors in the classroom, et cetera, that uh, are problematical, um, as will those who have the permanent needs, like, like autism, like, like, like uh, ADD, et cetera. So what often we mistake is thinking, you know, this child is um, of major concern, whereas in fact, there's something in the background that, that's there. And we look at boys and girls, and, and it's, it's often easier to tell that a boy is struggling. Uh, they wear their heart in their sleeve to a certain extent, my three sons do. Um, and girls sometimes can, can disguise that a little bit. They don't necessarily show how they're feeling. And the boys are quite out, outward with that. They could be throwing something across the room or swearing or doing something that, that's not appropriate. So we often mistake the fact that uh, this child has a major issue, whereas in fact, it could be something that in another 12 months or even a few weeks uh, will, will actually change. And getting to talk to them about that is really important. The other thing that came out of DSM-5 is the need for water. And I always have my bottles of water here with me. Um, it's been shown, and you can have a look at the research yourself, that about 90% of boys, or more than 90% of boys, in any classroom, any time of day or night, are dehydrated, which means that the ability for them to think uh, logically and, and to work and to concentrate, and our brain basically is, is water, 85% 80, water, is really compromised. And we believe, and this is difficult to, to compare, the girls are around about 60%. So straight away, there's a difference now between the ability of boys to concentrate and also you know, the, the, how they're going to perform in a classroom situation. And we've got lots and lots of answers to that, which we haven't got time to go through. But if you want to, um, and I'll show you the website at the moment, contact me. You can do that through the website. 
Um, I also managed during the um, lockdown to produce uh, a, my book, Boys and Their Schooling, which is the title uh, of the seminar today. And there's lots of other material there that you can have a look at. We look at PTSD, uh, even the APGAR score, which uh, mothers will know is the first evidence that there's some trauma to the baby, and of course to you uh, during childbirth, uh, that will cause issues in later life. One of the things that'll come up today is, is that you know, early um, uh, intervention or, or early development of the brain, uh, our boys and girls brains the same. They are fairly much the same, apart from some differences in sizes, and without going into great detail about that, and there's lots of experts who um, are on the websites who can tell you things about it. One of the things that happens is as testosterone levels increase in our boys, and it isn't at birth, as you know, it's, it's often about, it can be between eight and, and, and 15. As the, the, those levels increase, their levels of dopamine drop. And as levels of dopamine drop and drop and drop, it triggers and it can trigger things like ADD, autism, uh, 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 even other uh, things that we haven't put a name to as yet. So dopamine is more likely to mean that boys are more likely to be in trouble, more likely to be diagnosed with a condition than girls. And that's something that is worth, if you're interested, looking at and, and, and having a, a bit of a, a look around at what's there. Um, I won't go through comorbidities, um, and, and there, as you probably know, there's changes to the diagnosis of ADD, ADHD. In the olden days, which is only a few years ago, the, the diagnosis would mean that every boy you've ever taught has ADHD uh, and needs to be medicated or sedated. Um, that's not true. Uh, and now they've really changed that and made it much more specific. And many, many girls who have ADD stay below the radar. Again, these new criteria will help us to find those girls who also have uh, longer term issues in terms of um, self-harm, uh, relationships uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, going down the list, I'm not going to go through all of these because of time. Uh, Two-way relationships with boys are really crucial at school, which means that we don't just get to know them, they need to get to know us. Uh, and in the olden days of the, I can think, think of the nuns with the rulers, uh, uh, we actually spoke about ourselves and they had relationships with us. They knew our name, they knew our family, they knew what we liked to eat and the movies that we watched uh, and all the rest of it. We didn't know much about them. And so when they said, you know, I feel really whatever when you did this, the impact isn't very strong because they don't, we don't actually know them as a person. We know them as an icon, as a, as, a, as a person in the room. We don't know much about their life. So one of the things that we do in, in the Institute is to say, build up a two-way relationships with, uh, with boys in particular, and girls, of course, too. I do work with Edith Cowan University here in Perth uh, as a teacher supervisor and, and, and assessor. And that's the first thing I say, if you're going to control a class, if you're going to manage the boys, make sure they know a little bit about you. Not too much, uh, but a little bit about you, not just what sport you barrack for or what team you go for, but a little bit more about you as a person. So when you are concerned about their behaviours or their lack of um, application, you can actually tell them that one-to-one, -one, there's a much greater chance they're going to actually perform better for you. Right towards the bottom, the, the second last one, uh, I want to spend a moment on peer esteem versus self-esteem. Um, and I think what I might do is just show you, if I just bear with me for one moment, uh, the very latest stuff here. Um, let's see if that comes up. Um, most boys um, have an artificially lower level of self-esteem. And this is something that probably is about four or five years old only. Um, what we find is that they tend to, uh, when we look at um, uh, uh, them in the classroom, we're worrying, how is that? Why do they have that? And, and you'll know from co-ed schools and from and boys' schools and, and from girls' schools that it's more likely that girls will compliment each other. And, and the girl will say today in your school, your hair looks beautiful today, Joseph. Mate. Imagine a boy saying, your hair looks fantastic today, Tom. Maybe it happens at your school, but it's unlikely. So what happens is we find that boys then don't have really know much about their qualities, the positive things about them. They might be covered in bruises because they're, they're popular, but they don't actually have the names or the words for uh, thoughtful, uh, careful, uh, honest, uh, and reliable, all those types of things. So we need to really remember that we need to use more of those words when we praise boys and don't just say, well done, fantastic. Um, we have a seesaw that we look at in, in the Institute and if we look at, say, self-esteem at one end and peer-esteem on the other end, 
when the self-esteem of a boy or a girl starts to drop like that, the peer esteem normally starts to rise. So in other words, I don't think I'm a nice person. I've never been told anything nice. My parents criticize me. No one says anything good about me. So therefore, I'm going to act up in the classroom. I'm going to make funny noises, you know, farting noises, so somebody will laugh or I'm going to answer back. So I want to increase my peer esteem. And that whole seesaw is about bringing that back to some kind of level, level playing field. So when you look at boys and you think, gee, they're full of themselves, what we're probably seeing is the peer esteem. At the other end of that seesaw, it's very likely the self-esteem is low. I've only got four minutes, so what I want to do now is to quickly have a look at some of the things that we need to know uh, in terms of the classroom. And what we're finding, and this is going back about four or five years, is that productive pedagogies work. So in other words, when there's intellectual quality in a lesson, boys do better. When you connect what you're teaching to their lives beyond school, they do better. Um, when you have supportive classroom environments where they feel valued and are encouraged to take risks in their learning, they do better. Um, when you recognise and celebrate difference uh, of, of children and, and of, of sex and, and colour of skin, all those types of things, boys do better. So, And, of course, when you look at all those things there, girls do better as well. It's just that if a boy is not being engaged, if he's not really on board because he thinks this has no relevance to me, and I taught maths, uh, as you know, Jackie, for many years, and I'd start, you know, trigonometry. There'd be always a boy's hand would go up, and I always taught co-ed. Uh, and, and, the, and the boy would say, how am I going to use this, use this in my life, sir? And I used to say, you can become a maths teacher. Uh, and they go, oh, mm. uh, and I say, yeah, we need more maths teachers. But otherwise, if they think it's not really going to uh, be useful to them, they shallow learn it. They only learn it enough to get through the test or to get through the assignment. And about a month later, you say the word, you know, cause or sign, and it may as well be something in Hebrew. It's gone. They don't tend to retain it unless they think it's going to be used. And with the teacher themselves, with all the teachers here, uh, they want you to know what you're talking about. Uh, they want to know that you know them and, and about how they are as people and not just as, as members of your classroom. Uh, they want to know that you understand that it's not just about uh, giving out knowledge, especially these days, and giving out facts, information. We've got Google for that. We've got lots and lots of other things kids can go to. It's about understanding all those other things that you're valuing adding or you value adding uh, to their learning. And what is actually being shown, one of the reasons we're here tonight, is that when a teacher has knowledge of gender concepts and how those impact on kids' attitudes and learning, again, boys do better. And sometimes I work with a school and they think, oh, boys, they should just be taken out there and, and uh, not shot, but, you know, taken off the campus. Wouldn't it be great uh, if we had them in a separate room or a stall or, or whatever? But when we actually talk to them about how great they are, and how wonderful they are, looking beyond the mask that they wear, and, and they get a bit of an inkling that this boy actually is a very nice person, but maybe I need to kind of work with them and, and, and have him take his mask off. The boys get it, and they know that beyond that, that mask, and often it's there right through puberty, as you know, uh, we can actually get through to the real person there. So in the classroom, finally, in terms of the classroom needs, what the boys want to have basically is relationships with you uh, and the same with girls and it means staff kids relationships staff staff kids staff they want feedback on how they're going and this is where we think during the lockdowns and the online learning they were not getting the feedback that they would get on a daily basis from their teacher um, they want evidence-based learning so at the end of a lesson they want to see something for their work and in, in subjects like mathematics like you know I've got that one right in subjects like home economics, I've made this, I can eat it, I can taste it, I can smell it. Um, they actually see the evidence of their work. But in some other subject areas, and often in, in, in middle to upper secondary, they don't see that they've actually achieved anything. And that's something that we need to really work on, evidence-based learning. They need to be challenged. And we need to have high expectations of them. And again, we feel that during the, the online learning, during the lockdowns, there wasn't enough of that. And therefore, there wasn't the impetus to, to work. And finally, you know, we need to decrease their anxiety and increase their attention spans. And it's shown through DSM-5 that attention spans have actually got shorter uh, over the last, well, probably over the last 15 years. And yet the, the length of our lessons have often got, uh, got, got longer and longer. 
Now, that's just a snippet of what we could spend six months talking about. Just wanted to introduce that um, and to talk about just very briefly neuroplasticity and, and uh, someone from New Zealand sent me questions on that. Look, when they're born, um, you know, the boys and girls are very, very similar in terms of that. There isn't a huge amount of testosterone or, or estrogen for the girls. But as we uh, talk to them, as, as we, we hold them, as we interact with them, as we give them things to play with, when grandma and granddad, who we are, uh, you know, come and give them, uh, talk to them, we often treat them differently. There's a boy, so I'm going to rough him up. I'm going to say, oh, okay. And, and we don't use the same language. So when they start school, very often the girls have three times the vocabulary of the boy. So therefore, right, and, and there's an alteration, the altercation in the yard. And someone says something to the boy, he hasn't got the verbal ability or the things to draw upon to respond. So it ends up with bum, or he punches somebody or bites somebody. And so this often is where we see kids or boys, particularly being what we feel is, and they are aggressive, but they haven't got the verbal background. They haven't got the literacy. And of course, literacy above all the things that we talked about today has changed dramatically uh, in our schooling system. And all the, the tests, all the assignments, all the way we've moved, we need kids to be more literate. We've always known that girls tend to uh, read more, that they tend to uh, have more time where they can sit down with a book. Boys often would rather play a game or do something active than that. So again, that's another factor there. So there's a snippet of that. Uh, I'm going to send the copy of this um, presentation, which we've done about a tenth of, to Jackie. Um, and she, I'm sure, will be able to send that to you. Or you can contact me directly through the website or just ian at voiceforward.com. I'll just lastly put the website up there for you to have a look at. Uh, and that's .au. The, the, internationally, it's just voiceforward.com. But my email address is ian at voiceforward.com. And you say, could I please have the PowerPoint from today? I'm glad they send it to you. Thank you so much for your attention. Ian, thank you so much. And yes, we'll definitely pass that on to people. Um, that was fabulous. And as a teacher, or I was going to say ex-teacher, but once a teacher, always a teacher. Yeah. A couple of things yeah. that really struck me and resonated with me was definitely that two-way relationship. And I always felt that it was so crucial in the first couple of weeks of the year. Yeah. You know, you've got that Absolutely. little window to really get to know your students and let them know a little bit about you. Although yeah. I must say, I was guilty of focusing on my favourite sporting teams quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, let them let them let them in a little bit, especially as yeah. they're starting to get older. Maybe not so much, you know, in the very oh, early yes. years, but as they're starting to get older. Yeah. Yeah, that mm. really resonated with me. Stick around because I'm sure we're going to have questions for you, Ian. And sure. as I start to do the roundtable discussion, feel free to also chime in um, with that as well. Okay. So I'm just going to share my screen again because I want to introduce our amazing panel that we have here today. Um, can you see that there? Yeah, great. Okay, we have, apart from me, and we've got five wonderful panellists with us today with a wealth of experience. And a really good cross-section too because we've got boys schools, girls schools, co-ed schools so we've got everything covered. So welcome to all of you. In fact I think what we should do is I might stop sharing the screen and uh, we'll go around and in I don't know whether you can do this if you can all turn your cameras on. I don't know whether you can do this in 60 seconds. Tell us who you are, where you are, what you've been doing and I'll tell you a little bit about your school. And I think to be respectful, I'm in Sydney, I probably should go to the person who's <laughs> furthest away. Um, so that would have to be Nick. So Nick, your 60 seconds, away you go. It's great to see everyone. Me in 60 seconds, I'm Nick Bevington, Head of Junior School, Dulwich College, Singapore. Welcome to Singapore Behind. We're a large co-ed school. We're academically selective and all the way through, we have 220 in each year group and 55 nationalities. And our second biggest is Australian. Um, my journey into teaching was attending an all boys grammar school in the UK. Um, we're all different. It probably wasn't the right school for me. Um, I uh, traveled um, widely after school and then um, worked abroad, went into international relations um, and then also worked summers in America. I had a career in industry in British Airways first, where there were both men and women. Um, and I realized however great finance was 
um, it wasn't where I wanted to be long term. I retrained in Newcastle, UK, um, and then worked in an all boys boarding school, ran all girls summer camps, worked in central London at a co-ed school, had two headships before Dulwich College, both co-ed. Um, and then in Dulwich College, I have um, visited a huge number of, of senior schools and I've advised parents on all types of schools and here we've been doing lots of research into our boys and girls and how they learn looking particularly at mathematics and seeing some of the differences and looking at some of the things that we might do to improve and I resonate with so much Ian said I hope that's 60 seconds great to see you all I'm mute myself thank you I honestly I didn't time you no pressure. <laughs> Thank you. I've actually been to your campus in Singapore a couple of years ago, just pre-COVID. Amazing school. So, all right. Thank you. And I guess if we're going to do it geographically, I guess I better just go to Peter now across the Tasman. Welcome. Thanks, Jackie. And uh, thanks, uh, Ian, for your presentation. I enjoyed hearing that. Uh, look, my background, I started off, I went through co-education myself. And then when I first went into the teaching world, I went into a co-ed open plan uh, decile one intermediate in New Zealand and loved it and it was just by chance I ended up at King's School in Auckland which is a boys only school and that's where I developed my passion for boys learning. Uh, in New Zealand at the time there was a real emphasis on uh, girls and learning and I think the boys were just missing out on education so it, it made me realise we need to do something with boys as well. I spent 14 years at King's then moved to Scots College in Wellington which went from years one to 13 became a principal and principal of a prep school, so years one to eight or grade seven, and then principal of a middle school, which is 11 to 15 year olds at Scots. I was there for 12 years and I moved to my current school, uh, St. Kennegan Boys School, uh, to year one to eight, so grade seven is where we finished. Uh, 610 children, and uh, we have in year seven and eight, uh, 300 students, 300 boys. And, um, and that's kept me busy uh, in a building program, but I'm, you know, sort of 35 years in boys' education and 22 years as a principal and still love every day. That's me. I love that last bit. Thanks, Peter. I've actually been to your school too. Um, and my son-in-law is an ex-student. How about that? My daughter married a Kiwi. Um, and loved his school, loved his St. Kentigan. All right, well, we have a couple of Queensland with us. Queenslanders with us today and you can see I wore my New South Wales blue colours just for you. <laughs> um, so perhaps Tony will go to you now please. Um, good evening everybody and um, and, and thanking, uh, thank you for, for um, having me on your panel. Um, so I'm, I'm principal of St Aidan's Anglican Girls School um, here in Brisbane, in the inner west uh, of Brisbane. So um, a, a small school, um, 950 students, about 300 in the primary school and 650 in the, in the high school. Um, an old school, um, about um, 93 um, years old. Um, and um, I'm also wearing a, a second hat this evening. I'm the um, board member and Queensland representative of the Alliance of Girls Schools Australasia as well. So that's an association for about oh, 120 member schools across Australia um, and um, and New Zealand, um, with obviously a focus on on girls education. Uh, my background um, is uh, is I've started um, my first two years of teaching in in co-ed schools with Education Queensland in North Queensland, but I have had over twenty five years of experience in boys schools, um, and it's only been in the last eight years uh, that I have what I say come back home. I had um, my own schooling was in a girls school, and I and I had a couple of years. Years of, um, of teaching in a girls' school right at the start of my career. So, um, Ian, it is an absolute pleasure to, um, to be on a panel with you because when I was in boys' schools, um, your research was absolutely the guiding light uh, for so much of, uh, of my teaching. So it's, um, it's an absolute delight to be here with you and I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tony. And to your fellow Queenslander now, to Lisa, welcome. Just unmute mute myself. Good evening, everyone. It's it's um, so fabulous to be here. Um, I am head of primary at uh, St Peter's Lutheran College in Indrapilly, which is about all oh, five minutes yeah. down the road from Tony. 
um, uh, probably could wave at each other if we stood high <laughs> enough in our schools. Um, unlike Tony, St Peter's is a, a, a Peter 12 school across three campuses. And we have about 3,000 um, students across those three campuses um, with about 580 in the primary years. Um, I started my career on the Gold Coast as a primary teacher in um, you, mostly in um, the early years at a co-ed school. Um, but my career, my teaching career has spanned um, both co-ed schools and boys' schools as well. I'm yet to, to be in a, in a girls' school, but I've worked with um, just the boys and currently now, again, back with co-ed. Um, currently in the primary years at St Peter's, we're, we're looking at um, three of our big ideas, I guess, um, in working with our boys and girls and their families is uh, developing um, parents as pedagogical partners with our students. Um, we're looking at our, currently we're looking at how we assess and how we can include student voice, both our boys and our girls student voice in, in our teaching and learning and in our reporting process and assessment process. And, and we're looking at how we can continue, and this is a tricky one, continue to develop both our boys and girls as leaders um, when, when we look at the difference between the way the boys and the girls um, develop. Um, through the primary years. I myself went to a co-ed school back in the day when girls weren't allowed to do manual arts and boys weren't allowed to do home ec. So that's perhaps how old I am. Um, again, so grateful to be here tonight. Um, I love my job. I learn um, from our little people every single day. Thank you, Lisa. You. Thank you. And I'm sorry to say I remember those days too. <laughs> um, last but not least, and also wearing blue, I think. Um, my fellow New South Welshman, Daniel, welcome. Thanks, Jackie. I deliberately put my jacket on to make sure that I was waving the flag for New South Wales, Australia. So, look, welcome everybody, and it's so good to um, to be here. Um, it, I was just reflecting, listening to Ian about my own schooling. Um, I remember I was a country boy. I grew up on a farm, and I remember in year eleven and twelve, I was sent off to boarding school um, to an all boys school, and um, what a change that was. Ian, I wish you were around then. Um, to have a chat to some of my teachers. My goodness, that we've come a long way in boys there, in, in, since then. It's good to have you on board here. Uh, look, a little bit about me. Um, I'm at MLC uh, School in Burwood in the inner west of Sydney. We are a, a um, independent girls' school from pre-K. That's the year before kindergarten all the way to year 12. We obviously follow the New South Wales HSC, but we also are an international baccalaureate school for our senior girls where they do the diploma. And um, we are a very diverse multicultural school. We're very proud of that. We have girls that travel across Sydney to, to come to this school and we we um, pull them from all, all corners of the city and we, we pull people from all sorts of cultural backgrounds, faith backgrounds, et cetera. Uh, we are a United Church school, but we are really inclusive. Um, and a little bit about what we do here at MLC. Obviously, being a girls' school, um, we really try and tailor, and I suppose we'll talk about more later, but I'm really big on engagement in terms of how do we engage students and how they learn. I think that's probably the emphasis more so even sometimes the agenda, it's about engagement. So we're very much looking at that and how we engage our girls in all subject areas and breaking those glass ceilings. And that's what this school's really about, is about breaking glass ceilings for, for our girls. Uh, a little bit about my background. Um, I was initially primary trained and worked in many disadvantaged um, communities. I ended up working as a teaching consultant, um, traveling across New South Wales, consulting to many different primary and secondary schools. I had a break from teaching for a while um, and, um, and, you know, and, and explored corporate life and I wasn't there for very long. I hated it. I was back where I love, which is back in schools and working with like-minded professionals. And um, it's so good to be with like-minded professionals tonight. So happy to be here. This is my second girls' school. I was at Winona uh, in North Sydney prior to this, and I'm head of the junior school here. About 500 girls in the junior school um, amongst our 1,300 in total. Thanks so much, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. What an amazing panel we have. Just incredible, the wealth of experience we've got here. Now, I've got a bunch of questions that I'm going to ask the panel, and I'll try to direct them and share the load around to a few of you at a time. But honestly, feel free if you've got a question, raise your hand, <laughs> shout it out. If you want to add something um, to that conversation, please do so. Now, before we start the first question, a reminder to the audience out there, we're going to have Q&A for you after this. Please use the Q&A box, not the chat box. You can start as soon as you're ready. And it would be a really good idea um, if you maybe say where you're from 
And who are you directing your question to? Is it a general question for the whole panel or was there somebody in particular you wanted to ask? So use the Q&A box if you've got any questions and then following this roundtable discussion, we'll head to that Q&A box. All right, I might start talking about school readiness. Perhaps Nick, Lisa, Peter, you might be good people to start with on this one. So are girls more school ready than boys at the beginning when they first start school? Now, I know as I, I sort of explained this at the start in case you missed it, we're being very broad and very general with some of these questions. You know, not all girls are the same, not all boys are the same, we know that, but there are some common things and commonalities. And I know that there is some research out there to suggest that, you know, given a five-year-old boy and a five-year-old girl and they're starting school, that more than likely the girl's going to be more ready than the boy and the boy will catch up later. Do you agree? I'm going to go to Nick. Do you have any thoughts about what I just said? I think it depends what you're actually going to do in the first year of school. And if you're thinking about what we traditionally think of school, which is people sitting around beautifully, um, doing careful tasks and working hard and being diligent and good, then people's perception can sometimes be that more girls are ready for that than boys, albeit that there'll be some of each gender. If, however, you're thinking about inquiry and exploration and, and, and uh, talking and, and act, active, uh, active learning, discovering the world and developing skills in different ways, then I think that there, you could say then actually sometimes there can be some girls who are uncomfortable with that. Who, so, but I'm, I'm always wary of generalising. And I think that what Ian said at the beginning is true, that fundamentally there's more similarity than difference in those early years. And the differences, I think, are, are the way we subconsciously or unconsciously treat girls and boys differently as they grow up. Interesting. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. I'm going to go to you because you've taught in boys' school and now you're in a co-ed school. Any thoughts on that? Have you ever noticed that, generally speaking, the girls start off? Uh, I agree with Nick. It, it depends on, on the curriculum that, that you plan and implement in, in your prep program. And, and we're an international baccalaureate PYP school, so our uh, prep program, actually all of our um, from programs from prep to year six are inquiry driven and, and our prep program is very play based as well. However, we are a school that has high expectations, high academic expectations as well. So as we're looking at the little people that we're going to fill our prep classes with, I'm very aware um, that we have to be careful with our, not only the boys, the boys and the girls with regard, regards to readiness, I see girls coming uh, with a few more uh, pro-social skills. Um, they're a little bit more creative. Their connection to language is a little bit more developed. Again, um, there's boys like that as well, but if we're talking as a whole. Um, and, and I think sometimes girls um, are a little bit more confident as they come in, in into to the school to interview with, with us and as they engage in our prep program as well. However, those uh, boys, the skill, the, the, the boys come in and they have... Um, their spatial and mechanical functioning is often uh, more developed than the girls as well. Um, so I, I agree with Nick, it depends on, on the um, prep program that you have established. However, I think we have to be really careful when looking at both boys and girls at, 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 and their readiness for school because they're at school for a long time. That's what I, I, I sort of talk to the parents and say, these little people are at school for a long time. We've got to get it right here. And sometimes little boys need another year in a preschool setting. Sometimes little girls need a, another year in a preschool setting. Um, but but I, I find if we're talking generally, um, the, the little girls are coming with a little bit more um, language and, and the, those pro-social skills that, that we look for. So we have to be careful that we're not forgetting our little boys. Yeah, thank you. I know that it's one of the things that causes more anxiety in parents than anything yeah. is, should my child start school? When should they start? Because if they've got that birthday that's kind of, you know, they're only just five or they're mm. turning five early in the year and it's, do I start now or do we wait another year? And I, I know a lot of advice is often given, well, if it's a boy, let them wait. So mm. the thought that's why this might be a good topic. And I do just want to go to Peter, if you don't mind, Peter. 
you've been working in boys schools for quite a while but thinking about what Nick said about the adjustments to the curriculum and you know is that what goes on in the first I know you call it year one don't you your first year of school over there what's happening in boys schools in year one uh, well, look I, um, look, I think everyone that's spoken so far, you're right, to, we cannot afford to generalise. But what I do is I, the boys, uh, I find, are really ready for the next step. I find sometimes they've outgrown their preschool or kindergarten because it's such a smaller environment and they, uh, the boys start to get a wee bit more uh, sort of competitive or want to be more active. And so when you come from your preschool or kindergarten and put them into the school environment, um, you know, it teaches them that they, they have to learn those socialization skills very quickly and they just love the, the greater freedom. Uh, I would say that I find our boys need routine and structure and, uh, and they really uh, gain from that uh, all those skills that the teacher imparts and, and to get them ready for their learning. And look, I'll be upfront and honest, boys also need to change what they're doing on a regular basis uh, to keep them motivated and keep them engaged in their learning. Because if they're not engaged, then then they will switch off. But if they are engaged and they're doing a variety of things, they are uh, absolutely thriving in a school environment. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I think um, the first thing I noticed when I moved from a boys a, a co-ed school to a boys only school, you do lose that softness in a classroom, um, and it's a case of sort of re-engaging the boys into what it means to be uh, careful of each other and and not just look after themselves. So. I certainly think they're ready. Thank you. In fact, I might switch the order of questions now that you've brought that up because I was going to bring this up later. But I mean, I'm working, I've taught in classrooms for a very long time. And I there was a little bit of controversy about this question at the Matific team when we discussed this, that it wasn't a very politically correct question to be asked, and be controversial. But I wanted to talk about self-esteem in the classroom and how perhaps boys do impact girls. And there's been a bit of research about um, the benefits of, if you do have a single sex school, what the benefits are to girls and the benefits are to boys compared to having a co-ed school. I did find particularly in the older years, when I say older years, I taught primary school. So when I was teaching years five and six, as the boys got bigger and louder, um, sometimes the girls felt a little bit intimidated by that. I might go to Tony. Um, and some of the benefits there, what do you think? What are some of the benefits there of, are, are the girls a little bit intimidated sometimes by the boys? Do you think there's a benefit for them to have that classroom time maybe on their own? Yeah, thanks, Jackie. Um, I wouldn't say intimidated. I, I would say um, unheard, you know, not, not noticed sometimes in terms of, uh, I, I probably, um, first of all, draw on my experience in boys' schools and, and recognise the, the physicality um, of boys is, um, is, um, is, you know, is, is way more than, than girls and just, uh, you know, that um, louder voices, you know, that, 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 that sort of thing. So for girls in a, in a girls' school, the benefit is absolutely um, girls' schools specialise in girls. So everything um, that uh, a boy would do in a co-ed school, girls are doing. So girls are seeing girls in leadership positions. So um, even in the even quieter girls uh, are in leadership positions. Um, they're, they're seeing, um, you know, girls are doing science, et cetera. So I think the, that the fact that they have to step up because there are no boys and there's no then tend tendency to um, step back and let the boys, you know, have, um, have the loud voices and, uh, and, and perhaps even speak for them as well. So, um, you know, the, the, the benefits uh, besides that, then in terms of spe uh, specialising for girls, every single thing that is done in a girls' school is designed for girls. So expert teachers who um, have, uh, you know, pedagogical knowledge around how, how girls learn, their emotional, social needs, um, programs we deliver, facilities uh, are, are all designed and catered for girls. I know that, thank you. And I know that Ian talked earlier a little bit about this, about the, I guess the EQ, the emotional side yeah. of things that girls bring to a classroom. And I used to notice it, particularly in topics like when no, novel study, you know, mm. learning about a novel and, you know, uh, researching the characters and discussions and so on. It definitely would have had a different vibe, I think, if I didn't have the girls there. Ian, have you got thoughts on that? Yeah, they're very true. I've been in situations where we've seen 
kids in the classroom and say there's uh, English in, in high school. Um, and quite often the girl is, is more able to express herself and, and to say things that, you know, in a very fluent way. And the boy thinks, oh, my voice is, you know, breaking and I won't be able to say it properly and, and whatever. How will I look in front of the girl who I think likes me or whatever? Uh, and so sometimes that does intimidate them a little bit. Um, and when you've got a single sex environment, th there's none of that, as, as uh, Tony was saying. So sometimes it's, it's good for both. Uh, but it's also a little bit about expectation. Um, if we say, look, is that the best you can do? I'd love everyone to do that after today. To most boys, as they're writing something, they'll say no. Uh, if you, you say, is that the best? And you can whisper to them on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, because often they'll get away with a very kind of slipshod work unless we keep on their back a little bit. Unless we, as teachers, have a high expectation, I think, as, as Nick was saying, um, then they will just get away with uh, as little as they can. But if the girls are really doing really well, then we find that, you know, often they'll come up to the party because, you know, I don't be looking an idiot in front of them. So it's a very complex one and there's no single answer and it's just not, nothing to do with the gender of the teacher, which some people say, oh, that was a male teacher, the boys would do so. But that's not true. It makes no difference in terms of that. But yes, it's a complex question. All right, it certainly is. And I might go to Daniel on a slightly different topic, just getting off that a little bit, I want to talk about STEM because, you know, research has shown that even in 2021 last year, there's still an imbalance in, say, we, um, and I'm primary school focused, but look at the HSC, that's the final year of school in New South Wales, the exams, there's still an imbalance, a gender imbalance with more boys doing those STEM subjects than girls. Although I hear that that's maybe different in all girls' schools. So I don't know, do you have any thoughts on that, Daniel? Anything you want to add about that? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question, Jackie. Um, STEM here is something that is a big focus in our school, and that's probably because we, we are indeed a girls' school. And look, like this, the panel, I don't think it's about necessarily teaching boys and girls differently. Our big focus here and what we've been learning on in our research into STEM has been about the way we engage our students. So for us, we are obviously catering our teaching in our way to engage the girls in STEM and how we do that. So if, if I take um, you know, a boys' school example, they're really into bumper cars and doing those kinds of active things. Well, there's a great physics lesson right there and then. And that's the way to engage the boys. And for the girls generally, it, what are they interested in? What do we cue in? And so for our lessons, the way we do it, we're really cueing into the things that they enjoy. And, and keeping in mind, that's still very diverse, but it's very much catered for what they do and how they do it. And that's where we weave our STEM through that. And so that's really important. Um, and look, I couldn't agree more then about if, if it's a male teacher or female teacher, but it, the other thing is, look, there is still the great divide in this area of STEM. And unfortunately, in society, we haven't, we're not there. We're not even with the males and females in our roles yet. It's, a sad, it's sad to say in 2022, we're not there yet. We've got a long way to go. But um, in terms for girls' education, obviously having some great female role models in that STEM field is something that is really important as well. Because when um, young women and young men for that matter are looking out into that industry, the models they're seeing are still predominantly male. So we've got some very much work to do. But Jackie, to answer your question, I really think it's about engagement. How do we engage our students, particularly how do we, in, in our case, how do we engage our girls? And we do that well. We know our girls. We know what works for them. And look, the same can be said in, in a boys' school, engaging them in STEM as well. And, of course, in a co-educational school, you've got that balancing act. Yeah. Jackie, yeah. could I just add, if that's okay, in terms of I completely agree with Daniel and um, someone tonight talked about parent engagement. I think there's a lot in that too, in terms of breaking down stereotypes. So I, I can't believe how many parents walk through our school and see our workshop and see hand tools on the on the wall or laser cutters and say, oh, do girls do girls use these too? You know, so so there's still yeah, there still is a lot of work to do in terms of um, raising awareness of of parents in terms of um, unconscious bias and gender stereotypes. Thank you. And speaking of that, and I know we're already going, we're talking so much, we're going out of time, I'm going to run out of time. But just one quick thing, my love sport. Um, you know, there's so much media coverage these days of um, girls playing sport in traditional men's 
sport. You know, we're seeing AFLW and NRLW and the Matildas are on TV and the women's cricket's on TV. And, you know, as we talked about, Lisa, before in our day, um, we pretty much saw the female tennis players and that was about it. So I'm wondering, is that happening at the school level as well? Are we seeing, and I'm thinking more about the co-ed schools now, are we seeing girls being offered those traditional boys' sports? Nick, I might even go to you. Are the girls offered cricket and soccer and all, all of the tra more traditional boys' sports? Uh, there is a massive change um, to things like cricket, games like cricket, um, which were traditionally seen as boys' games, being accepted um, by, um, uh, or being embraced, I should say, by girls. I was so interested in what Tony was saying earlier on about um, unheard. And, and, and I feel like girls who wanted to play cricket, just like girls in the classroom perhaps, have been unheard. And, and now we are beginning to hear those, um, th th those same desires that all children have. And, and I, I was also really interested in what we, has been said about stereotypes. And you could say, well, girls don't play rugby or girls do girls use those kind of tools? And I think that what we found out in our school is that it's often around the way people talk to girls. And you can be talking about the same thing, but the conversation that people have with a girl about the same subject, be it maths or, or be it playing rugby, is different from the sort of conversation that they have with boys. And so I think we as teachers need to think about how we talk to children. Um, and we need to think about the challenging all of those um, stereotypes. And we are embracing the, the sport, the, the, uh, the, the rugby, the, the, the cricket, the football. Um, but I think that's almost emblematic of a wider um, sort of emancipation of the way that we think. Thank you. Look, there's so much more I would love to discuss about this, but I don't want to eat into the Q&A time at the end. So what I want to do is remind everybody now to start putting your questions to the panel. It might be to a specific panellist or it might be just a general question. Pop that into the Q&A box. While you're doing that, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and quickly tell you a little bit more about Matific while people are typing in their questions and we've got people sorting out the best questions. So pop those questions into the Q&A box. I know a lot of you out there are already using Matific and you already know all about it, but in case you don't, I'm just going to quickly explain what it is. We were talking about mathematics before. It's a mathematics resource. <laughs> It's online, it's specifically designed for primary schools. There are thousands of these activities. They're mostly these bright, colorful, interactive ones. We talked about attention span before. There are only five questions. So it's just a nice bite size for them to focus in this rich task, finish it five or 10 minutes later, take a deep breath, refresh and recap, and then move on to the next one. And it's available in now in over 120 countries. It's amazing, um, in over 40 languages. And hello to everybody, Kiora if you're in New Zealand, it's available in Tereo Māori, as well as we've got Cantonese and Mandarin and all sorts of languages. So, so nice for the students to be able to use a resource that is in their own language. It's very special, removes that cultural bias as well if you're using it um, as an assessment tool. It's aligned to your local curriculum. There's live detailed reporting for the teachers. There's a free app, you can use it on an iPad or you can use it on a PC, any type of device. And I get asked every day of my life, how is Matific different? Because you might have been using something else for a while or you might have in the past used something else. So my answer is always go and look at what the students are doing. Look at their screens. What does that activity look like? Because look at this one that you're looking at now. That's actually teaching the split strategy. Did you see that little jiggle there? There's no red cross if they make an error. And unfortunately, even in 2022, a lot of online resources look a bit like a test or a worksheet on a screen. And that's where Matific is very different. There's built-in scaffolding and guidance to help teach that strategy. So parents love it because the students are very independent if they're working at home, doing it for homework they're getting taught that concept. And it's not, it takes away, we talked about anxiety. There's so much maths anxiety out there. We also talked before about um, STEM. We need to foster a love of mathematics in children when they're young. There's a big gap between primary school and high school mathematics. And that's what our aim is to increase student engagement and learning when they're young. 
gets them ready for high school. Now, if you haven't seen this already, a few months ago, we launched our new student interface. So you've got a teacher interface and a student interface. It's pretty awesome. So it does feel like you're part of a Disney movie or something. So this is what it feels like if you are a student when you log in, there are avatars, there are avatar rewards if they do well. This is the teacher side where a teacher can assign activities for students to do at school or at home. You can choose your topic, choose the level. It's very easy to differentiate. You can group your students. You can see that student follows the pathway or the students can go to Adventure Island and they work completely independently. This is a placement test. It starts with that, doesn't take too long, 10 or 15 minutes, they're done. And then it's correct differentiation and it's automated for you. So now this child follows that personalized pathway and those activities will be assigned at the correct level for them and it will continually adjust. And of course, you see all the data from the placement test and everything that they do is tracked and recorded, um, which is great. And as I said, lovely little rewards along the way, there's certificates and stars and all sorts of things, very motivating for the students to do and it does progress right up until well in New Zealand we'll call it year seven and eight end of primary school we do have a lot of high schools using it too in the early years as well because the content's very rich so if you've seen Matific before it's the same amazing maths um, content but it's all packaged so beautifully for the children and now this is a special offer we always offer a free trial but it's normally only 30 days but this will just launch this for you get your cameras ready to scan that QR code you got it? <laughs> so we're going to give you complimentary access to the end of May, which is a really long trial. And now, obviously, if you've just had free access last year or this year, we can't give it to you again. We were very generous during the pandemic. We gave hundreds and hundreds of schools free access to help them with remote learning. Um, so I'm sure you understand we can't keep giving free access. But if you've not tried it before, this is a great chance because you get complimentary access to the end of May. So scan that QR code and we will be in touch with you and we'll get you started. It's very easy to get you up and running. So now I can see in our Q&A box, we've got some questions, which is awesome. And we're going to start getting to those questions now. Q&A. We have um, Ramdani. Here's a question for Ian. Um, what about the ratio of girls to boys? Are there any influences in their behaviours regardless good or of good or bad behaviour? So I think I understand the question there. Talking more about behaviours and the ratio of boys to girls, how that influences that. Yes, um, if you're looking at uh, you know, behaviour management and you're looking at suspension and, and expulsion or whatever, we all know uh, that uh, if we have a co-ed school, you're going to have many more boys than girls uh, in, in those uh, areas. We probably don't realise that in terms of that, as I said at the beginning, many of the um, things that they're doing uh, are to gain, gain attention and to raise their self-esteem by being silly, by answering back, whatever. Um, but um, dopamine has been implicated in that. Uh, not saying, you know, it's, it's not their fault, but it's sometimes the fact that if you're looking at this is kind of, you know, the behaviours we see and these ones are, are different to that, then that's that's not good enough. But I think what we normally find in a co-ed school, they say we've got a major issue here, 86%, I think that's the figure that they use of suspensions of boys. So what's wrong with boys? You know, what, what can we do better? Um, but if we look at in the earlier years, uh, the junior primary, we look at obviously, you know, at the end of high school, et cetera, those figures aren't there. Um, and so I think it's purely the fact that as they're developing, as they're trying to seek peer esteem, uh, as they uh, have a, maybe an undiagnosed uh, need, uh, they're more in your face with that, whereas the girls often will use other means, social media, et cetera, although the boys are reverting to that too at the moment. Um, so it's really the fact that it, it's, it's to do with dopamine. Um, and I'm very happy that person contacts me directly to send him some of the things that uh, probably explain. Uh, why those ratios or is that thank are. you okay thank you Ian now we have a question from Lynn in Auckland so I might ask Peter or Ian might want to answer what this either of you um very specific how do I teach boys to engage in writing I, I might start that one I think the thing is with anything if you want to engage a boy in writing he's got to connect with what he has to write about yeah and so you've got to find what is he interested in 
what does he have that knowledge on that he can then put uh, down in a written form and engage him that way? Uh, because and, and you can role model what you want, but a boy won't write unless he is really interested and engaged in what he what you're asking him to do. So you've got to find that that sort of that that gold moment. I even found that with mathematics, you know, if you're doing problem solving, give them a question that a topic that they're interested in. Um, they're much more willing to have a go. Can I just add to that too, Jackie? Yeah. I found particularly with little boys and writing um, that if you talk about it with them first, first of all, yes, it's got to be something that they are engaged in and interested in. But if they talk before they write, they write you've got a little bit more um, opportunity for success. So to verbalise first. Yeah. Mm, really good tip. All right, we have a question from Thomas, also in New Zealand. and they, Thomas is saying that their school is transitioning from being an all-boys school to a co-educational in 2023. Any tips from anyone? Has anyone ever been through that? No. Sorry, can't help you, Thomas. I, 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 I mean, I've seen lots of schools in the UK did that. Um, and I think the key is not to be a boys' school with girls. Um, <laughs> you've got to think about what your students need, what your girls need. And actually, I think if you come back to what Ian said early on, that lots of the, the good things that you do in education are actually common to both. But there are some things that I think you can watch out for. For instance, um, the sorts of activities that, that girls tend to thrive in can be different from the sorts of activities that boys tend to thrive in. And if something is competitive and time pressured, then that can cause anxiety in girls, but excitement in boys. And some of the things that you might get results that tell you one thing because the way you're measuring it is, is, is in, a, in a certain way. And so think about things that are less time pressured, things that, um, for instance, don't focus on who puts their hand up or who responds the quickest, but gives everyone time to consider and gives everyone time to give feedback. There we go, Ian, is that good advice? Uh, perfect, I couldn't have answered that better. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. And this one might be good for Daniel. Um, if you if you game so this is from Leanne who's a graduate teacher in a regional primary school teaching a grade three four composite class who says and this is close to my heart here I have several female students who have already given up on being proficient in maths and actually when I referred to STEM before the, there's been studies that show that the gender stereotypes already start happening between the ages of eight and twelve any tips Good for her to be in a regional school to start with being a country boy. Good to hear some teachers, teachers out there helping our rural communities first and foremost. Interestingly, here in the girls' school, we do maths the first thing of the day. It is the very first subject we do. And we deliberately do it as a girls' school because we talk about we're starting the day with fun. We're starting the day with engagement. And it's often, I think, the tips, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, certainly it's a challenge, but some of the tips with the maths and the girls is, Think about the ways they best learn and they engage. Are they, you know, girls often like to talk their way through meeting. Are there opportunities? I mean, we spoke about talking for boys and writing. I couldn't agree more about that, having taught boys for many years. But it's the same for girls. They talk their way through meeting. Are there ways in terms of you engaging the girls that they have opportunities to share and talk and think about their mathematical concepts and then share and talk about, well, which one might have been a more mathematically correct, efficient way of getting there? So do, do those sorts of meetings. Um, Look, uh, in terms of young children, um, often yet yeah, many of these are important for boys and girls, but I think it's really important that when you set up your classroom, I assume that obviously you're in a co-educational school, that you give those girls those opportunities to use those resources as much as the boys can. Boys can sometimes by their nature get their hands in and be really, really active and the girls can sometimes sit back and that's where I think as an, as an educator, that's where you need to set up structures and processes um, in your classroom where the girls can have those opportunities to engage and use those manipulatives because we know by research that's how they learn for young students and so that they're not being overwhelmed by perhaps the enthusiasm for a better word of some of the boys in the class. So there's just a, a, a couple of tips um, first and foremost but I think also it's I, I believe you know you're a female teacher share your love of mathematics share your enthusiasm because I often think sometimes to Many teachers and many primary teachers, because we're generalists, some of them actually bring out their own 
insecurities about perhaps the area of mathematics as well. And I think this is something also to be conscious of is what are we projecting as educators when we are teaching those subjects? Because naturally we have our own innate biases as well as human beings. So um, you're a great female teacher in a country rural school, share that love of mathematics, that passion of math mathematics, share um, the, how it can be so advantageous for um, those girls in the class. You can do it through literacy as well. There are many great mathematics books uh, out there. There's heaps of them where you can share maths and learn through that way well. So there's another tip for you as well. And you got a lot of you got a lot of nodding there from me, Daniel, because in the last two years, sorry, six years, I've been training teachers with mathematics and visited hundreds of schools. And I talk about maths anxiety in students, but it's in a lot of teachers as well. There are a lot of teachers out there who don't want to teach year five and six just because they're worried about the maths. So it's all about teacher training as well. Um, look, I realise we're running over time, but we're going to do one more question if you can hang in there. Um, this might be a good one for you, Lisa. This is from Kate. Um, she's so she's in a co-ed school and she's wondering, is there any merit, and maybe whether you've tried this or not, Lisa, um, splitting girls and boys just for some classes? For example, mathematics is the example she's given. We uh, do that currently, not all of the time. Um, we have a number of classes in mathematics, um, not so much um, within classrooms. We don't, we don't have boys and girls in classrooms because a lot of the research also tells us that you, you know um, that streaming uh, classes and, and separating classes out doesn't always work in a co-ed school. Um, we like to think that perhaps uh, we design tasks. We don't use any um, textbooks at, at St Peter's uh, in the primary years. So we design tasks, particularly in mathematics, that have a, a low floor and a high ceiling so that they can be accessed by, by all of the children in the class. However, we also have a, a gifted and talented um, specialist who works with some of our very, very bright children. And she often mentions that the boys can get enthusiastic about their answers. And, and often uh, the girls will sit back um, and, and wait to be asked before, before engaging in a task. So every now and then, in situations like that, where they're um, working on being stretched in, in their mathematical knowledge and, and engagement, we do have um, boys and girls working separately, but then we also always come back at the end and have a sharing time so that the, the boys and girls are getting to, to learn how to engage with each other. Thank you so much. I cannot believe how fast that hour has gone. We've actually gone over time. I hope nobody minds that we've gone a little bit over time. But I want to thank Ian, of course, but all of the panellists. What a fantastic discussion. As I said, I think we could have gone on a lot longer. There were still a lot of questions that we didn't get to. So I apologise if you had a question in the Q&A box that we that we didn't get to. Um, just a reminder, if you do want to try Matific, to zap that QR code. There's also going to be a very quick little survey when you log out. Uh, we really appreciate it if you could do that because that helps guide us as to what you'd like to see in the future. Thank you again to all of our panellists especially, but to all of the audience out there as well for giving up your time tonight. Um, you're going to also receive a um, follow-up email and that will have a certificate of for your attendance for today. So thank you again, wherever you are. I hope you're dry if you're in the flood zones and I hope you're healthy and I hope you're safe. Thank you and I hope to see you all again in the future. Bye for now.